Hudson. Walter Hudson, good morning, sir. Come, good morning. Coming in on short notice, and I appreciate it. Absolutely. Can candidates, uh, Minnesota State Legislature, House District 30, uh, 30A. Got a, a couple of things I want to run through here, and actually a bit of breaking news, and I'm really looking forward to getting your thoughts on it. Uh, the Saudis have made a statement with regard to the uh, to their OPEC production cuts. Mm -hmm. Saudi Arabia said today the U.S. had urged the kingdom to postpone the decision by OPEC and its allies, including Russia, to cut oil production by a month. Such a delay could have helped reduce the risk of a spike in gas prices ahead of the U.S. midterm elections next month. Now, if you remember when he was asked about this, that the Saudis were going to be held responsible for doing this, but the statement issued by the Saudi foreign ministry didn't specify the mention of the November 8 elections, which U.S. President Joe Biden is trying to maintain his narrow Democrat majority in Congress. However, it stated that the U.S. suggested the cuts be delayed by a month. In the end, OPEC announced the cuts at its October 5th meeting in Vienna. Now, this certainly would uh, push back against the way that the White House had, had framed this. And, and President Joe Biden's comments as of late that they were, you know, he wanted to hold the Saudis accountable for doing what they did. Well, I don't know how you hold people accountable who you depend upon. Right. And, and that's the whole point, right? The, the fascinating thing about this is the complete lack of accountability and taking of responsibility that not just Biden, but his entire party, both on the state and national level, have taken for putting us in this position where our gas prices are dependent upon somebody else producing energy. Mm -hmm. um, if we would just take the steps necessary to be able to produce our energy resources here at home, we wouldn't have to worry about what Saudi Arabia is going to do in October or any other month of the year. But it doesn't. But they're but they're speaking both sides here. Because you get, you know, you get Granholm coming out, you get Buttigieg coming out, and they're saying what I believe is the reality, that they actually won all of this. They, 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 they want the gas prices to be higher. They right. want us to get off of fossil fuels. They want us to adopt this green energy. But then, you know, this is... You know, this is then pushed back upon the fact that we're all frustrated by this. Midterm elections are coming up. It's an election issue. A lot of people are going to be voting on the rising inflation and the gas prices. So then you have Biden out there acting as if he's upset over this when the reality is, I think that they want this. I, th I don't think that they really care that they're cutting this. I think this is their desire. And when we get past the midterms, depending on what the outcome is, I'm very interested to see what this administration is going to do. If they're going to try to do anything or if they're going to continue just to let these gas prices go the way that they're going. Well, and this is why we're going to win, not just in these midterms, but long term. We're going to win the culture. We're going to take our country back. And this is why. Because their side is running, uh, swimming against the current of reality. Like their own narrative is not in sync with their reality that they have to operate in. Their policies are terrible and give us horrible results. Because of that, in the long term, we will win because people like to live, strangely enough. So you're taking a much more, and I appreciate this, and because I, I, I tend to take a more optimistic view on, on this as well. Um, I, I want to believe that regardless of party, the vast majority of people are still rational and understand what makes this country great. And so much of the surface level garbage that we see under what I've now been calling this woke dictatorship is not genuinely being accepted by the vast majority. We just haven't been in a position yet to see it yield results through through an election. I'll tell you this, though, Walter, it, it gets tougher and tougher. And it might just be a byproduct of what I have to do. In covering this every day, but it gets tougher and tougher to believe that we can turn back so much of what is being pushed forward right now. And then things that we'll be talking about here in uh, in, in just a few minutes. So I admire your your optimism. Um, but there's that part of me that goes, man, it reminds me of like a government subsidy program. Once it's implemented, it's so hard to pull it back. And I feel like so much of these things that we're dealing with within these culture wars is playing out in in a very similar fashion. Well, look, I mean, the like I say, the thing that is on our side is the tide of reality. Um, the fact that people need to buy gas, they need to put gas in their cars. Right? Like, so I, I got into an argument recently with a guy on Twitter. It wasn't really an argument, it was a discussion where he's promoting the idea that part of our infrastructure plan going forward needs to include things like e-bikes, like these electronic bikes. I saw that. I saw, okay. I, yeah, I saw that Twitter that that Twitter thread. And he's speaking in these these sanitary terms about the the 
virtues of transitioning to alternative forms of transportation. And I'm thinking to myself, dude, I got to get to work. My, my work is 10 miles yeah. away from my residence and that it's going to stay there. Right. I'm not going to change my job so that I can get an e-bike and save the planet. That's that is not my priority. My right. priority is to make the money I make in order to feed my family and pay my mortgage. And such so it is with literally everyone, even the Democrats, even the we saw this with the Martha's Vineyard effect. Right. Even the looniest lefties who are out there virtue signaling with their lawn signs when confronted with the reality of what they're saying, the migrant on their lawn mm -hmm. has to acknowledge that their ideas do not work. And that that is why we will win, because all we have to do is in, in a sense, we're doing what God does, which is letting the sinner have what he wants <laughs> and then living with the consequences and, yeah. and hopefully repenting and coming yeah. around. Amen to that. We'll talk more with uh, Walter Hudson coming up here on Twin Cities News Talk. Phone lines are open. 651-989-5855. like the breath of fresh air in here. Uh, leave a talk back via the iHeartRadio app. We'll get into a uh, couple of different stories. Actually, the Star Tribune picked up on this this morning. The version I have here is uh, from MemPost. Will the Iron Range finally go red? Control of the legislature could hinge on seven seats in northeastern uh, Minnesota. I believe you're heading up that direction uh, yep. pretty pretty soon. And again, uh, the Star Tribune picked up on it uh, uh, this morning as well. Uh, victories on and around the Iron Range, this comes from MinPost, have largely eluded the GOP thanks to union support and uh, veteran political giants like Tom Bach and uh, David uh, Tomasoni. Seeing them pronouncing that right? Yep. Okay, good. Uh, still, GOP legislative uh, hopefuls need to uh, only to look to the strong showings, according to MinPost, of Donald Trump and U.S. Representative Pete Stauber uh, to know the region is truly up for grabs. Although, based on the conversation that we were having off the air, um, it's a lot more than that at this point in time, probably, than just a... You know, strong showings of Donald Trump and being Pete Stauber. I think that's sort of the more of the ramifications of what's happening up in the Iron Range. But you're actually going to be heading up there today. What are your thoughts on this? Will the Iron Range finally finally go red? I think so. I, I think it will. Um, sir, if, if not this time, certainly soon. That's the trajectory. And the reasons why, you know, it's, it's interesting because they cite just the electoral results. Well, look to the results of right. Donald Trump. Look to the results of Pete Stauber. Let's talk about why. <laughs> Why is it going in that direction? And it's because the Democrat Party has left normalcy far, far behind in the dust. Mm -hmm. And, you know, folks up there on the Iron Range, pretty normal folk who live practical day to day lives that require an acknowledgement of basic reality. And uh, the Democrats are not for that. Very specifically, they're not for mining, which is something that's very important to folks up in the Iron Range. <laughs> OK, for which for which their their area is named. Uh, there are rare earth minerals up there that we need in order to power all of the fancy devices that the uh, yuppies down here in the Twin Cities demand as consumers, but won't allow us to produce the materials for here in the state of Minnesota. And it's costing jobs for folks up there on the Iron Range. And that's a that's your, your kitchen table politics, your kitchen table economics. Yeah, that's what's going to trump all the virtue signaling. So a lot, and it's also going to trump tradition. So, you know, my grandfather was a Democrat. My dad was a Democrat. The, the, the union uh, loyalties and all of that going back however many generations. All of that starts to lose value very significantly in the face of not having a job, not being able to pay, pay your bills, not being able to fill up your tank with gas. That's what's going up on the Iron Range. How much of what we talk about on the, uh, on the show of these... You know, these weird, woke circumstances, whether it's um, what we'll you know talk about in a bit here. Minnesota area realtors acknowledge a history of perpetuating racial bias, the push for equity in some of our larger institutions right now. What we call cancel culture, woke dictatorship. How much of that is reaching the individuals uh, in the Iron Range and and potentially impacting uh, their uh, their their voting decisions as well? Well. I, I think you'd have to go on a person by person basis to get their individualized stories because that is where it's happening. It's happening on the individual level. You know, I can give you a, a, an example. I, I can't share who, uh, but there was a person uh, of some prominence locally in my community who put up a post on Facebook that was just this benign uh, announcement about something that was happening in the local school district. You know, just kids doing something nice. And the comment section turned ugly extremely quick because somebody had to bring 
LGBT inclusion into it. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I hope there's going to be LGBT inclusion in this event that you're talking about. And it completely soured everything. I call it the what about gay phenomenon, mm-hmm. where just completely out of nowhere, inappropriately, w- with no precursor or invitation, people bring in inclusivity into whatever it is that you're talking about. The person ended up deleting the post, the, the original poster, a post that was about recruiting people to participate in something nice at school because they couldn't take the yeah. backlash that they were receiving. That that The stories like that are happening all over the place, all over Minnesota and all over the country. And they're taking people who used to be on the fence and turning them into conservatives. Well, and this goes back to kind of how we started the the conversation in the in the last segment. And, and it, it's driving at the question of, you know, where does the country want to live? Do they want to live in this bizarro quasi utopian world because it's morphed beyond that i mean that used to sort of be the liberal you know the the liberal idea of we can live in this type of utopia if we do this this and this but it seems like that's kind of been abandoned a bit because there seems to be almost an acceptance of even difficulty and hardship to achieve the goals that the left wants to go and achieve do people want to go and live you know in that world do they want to live in in a in a more realistic world that they are used to seeing uh and it's it's analogous to when i talk about school choice i think that that's where the next fight needs to needs to take place and that is school choice allow parents the choice to decide do they want their kid to go to a traditional doing that thing with my finger school where a teacher just wants to teach the basics they look like a typical teacher does they have the sporting events and the holidays like they normally do or they want to go to a school that is going all in on inclusion and is going to have you know your drag queen story hours there are, is going to change homecoming that is going to have a teacher that has multicolored hair that is going to push the pronouns uh, upon them you know which which world do they want to live in and I really hope that you're correct, and I believe that this will be the reality in the midterm election, that the majority of people in the country want to live in that other world that 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 we're so used to living in and not this bizarro one that a well, group on the left are trying to create. It's not even a question of what they want. It's a question of what is. It, you do live in the real world. I hate to break it to you. Yeah. Th- this is how it works. Doesn't Car- feel that way a lot of the time. <laughs> Cars run on gas. <laughs> Food costs money. Right. You know. Rare earth minerals come out of the ground and you got to dig to get to them. These are all real things that are not going to change. They are immutable. And so the only choice is whether or not we're going to take action and craft policy that is in sync with reality Mm -hmm. or whether or not we're going to continue to veer off into this ridiculous fiction that the Democrats are all for. The, uh, The contrast here. The choice that we have in this election and going forward until the Democrats have some sort of reformation where they become normal again, uh, the choice is between prioritizing theory and intentions over reality and results. Look at the Feeding Our Future scam. Okay, there, there are people when I go out and I talk and I engage online in particular on the Feeding Our Future scandal. There are people who are mad at me for pointing out the fact that $250 million was fraudulently misappropriated under the Walls administration with this Feeding Our Future scandal. They're mad at me. because Why? Because what are you going to do about the hungry kids? What, what does that tell you? It tells you that the thing they care about is what was the intention right. and what was the theory. Right. Theoretically, we're feeding children. The intention of the program is to feed children. Never mind the results. Don't look behind the curtain. None of that matters. All that matters is our feelings and what we hoped for and the utopia, as you put it. At, at a certain point, that becomes personal to people. Like when, when they can't put gas in their tank, when they can't put food on mm-hmm. their table, when they're having trouble paying their mortgage. And I talk to these people. It's a wonderful thing about being a candidate. It's, it, as an introvert, it forces me to actually talk to humans. <laughs> All right. And this is what, where people are at. They're concerned about their day to day lives. And the Democrats have no value proposition to offer whatsoever in regards to that other than, hey, if you do what we say, we won't call you a racist. Yeah, putting uh, we can move on to another issue here, but putting another sort of a period on the on the iron range conversation in the story here, it says the DFL's winning streak in, for legislative seat, uh, seats on the central iron range is intact. But GOP came close to ousting a few DFLers around the region in 2020. 
Uh, certainly not the landscape that we're living in now. It appears the landscape is even better for the GOP yeah. overall in the state. Uh, and I think the last time we uh, we had you on uh, a month or so ago, we talked about this. But I'll, I'll ask you again, like overall with these upcoming elections, what is your what is your expectation? How well do you think? I mean, it's tough. I mean, you, we, you know better than I do. Mm -hmm. You know, you've been here longer. But just, you know, how much of a stranglehold the DFL has had on the state for so long. How well do you think the GOP is actually going to perform? Well, I mean, there's really good signs. I mean, we've never had a better environment nationally or in the state um, for for Republicans. And all the indications seem to be that the wind is at our backs. The trajectory is going in our direction. I mean, you've got you look at the trajectory of polling, uh, even even looking at Jensen. You know, the, the big question mark is those statewide races. Right. Mm -hmm. like, are we going to have Scott Jensen as governor? Right. And the possibility is real. It really does seem like this is a very strong possibility that it could happen. It's all going to come down to turnout, which is why it's important for people to get out and to encourage their neighbors to get out and yeah. vote. Uh, it's going to come down to turnout and it's going to come down to shenanigans, right? Those are the two things. And uh, those are the unpredictable variables. Um, but I feel good about it because we're, we're at a point where folks are hungry for a change. I mean, the, the, the passion that people have uh, to stop what they see happening, the fraud, the 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 woke inquisition that's ongoing um, and to get back to a sense of normalcy and decency and hope, pride, like being able to feel good about yourself, being yeah. able to feel good about the state that you live in. People want that. And they're one vote away from making it happen. Well, and so much of what we're dealing with right now for, you know, a myriad of different reasons is a byproduct of the of the pandemic. Um, but I don't even think we're going to see, you know, every single aspect of the impact the pandemic had upon society until we even get further down the road. But I think a lot of what we're dealing with with these woke issues um, is a direct result of the pandemic and just what it did to people on a, on a personal, you know, on a personal level. But to to your point about the opportunities when I think everybody was waiting to get out of it, we all were waiting to get out from under the pandemic. And right. then suddenly, once we did, what were we faced with? Suddenly, we were faced with hardships that arguably were not for everybody. I think it's, you know, it's it's relative to individuals, but hardships that were more difficult than when we were under the pandemic, you know, and certainly more difficult than there was when Trump was in office. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so we it's like people haven't had a break. Like we went from one thing in the pandemic to finally coming out of it and feeling like, Hey, we're free and we're out in the world right now. But Oh right. my gosh, the world suddenly became a heck of a lot more dangerous. It became a heck of a lot more expensive. And suddenly now we're faced with all these issues that we weren't even talking about before. I think people are, are fatigued. Well, and the, the fatigue, it's, it's a self-inflicted wound, right? Like what we're going through right now with inflation and gas prices and me Biden having to, to, oscillate from begging Saudi Arabia to threatening Saudi Arabia over their production right. of oil. I mean, all of this insanity is self-inflicted. None of this had to be. None of it was written in the stars. It was a choice that was made by the people that we put in charge. And so the, people are waking up to that and realizing that this election is an opportunity to reverse course. And I think the thing that people are specifically fatigued about is being told what to do, mm -hmm. being told what to do, being told what to think, being told that they're wrong, being told that they're, they're, there's something r evil about them or wrong with them because they hold the values that they hold. Whether you're talking, going back to like the shutdowns and the mask mandates or this woke stuff. You know, the idea that if you believe, as I do, that your kid ought to be able to get through K through 12 without being confronted with all the different varieties of sexual proclivity. OK, <laughs> like if if that's your position, there's something fundamentally wrong with you, according to the left and according to many of the institutions, including potentially your own school district. Yeah. Right. Um, folks are sick of that. And there's only one way they're going to be able to push back against it, and that's by empowering us to return the control back to them. A Minneapolis uh, organization representing more than 9,000 realtors publicly announced Wednesday for a uh, – publicly, excuse me, apologized Wednesday – for a history of discriminating against people of color and creating barriers that made it difficult for them to own homes, along with reading the apology at a news conference, the Minneapolis Area uh, Realtors Association also announced policy changes to help prevent further uh, discrimination. Uh, basically, it's equity. 
It's your DE. It's your DEI right. um, being implemented now on within here. The realtors. We have the story of the medical students condemn, condemning gender binary colonialism, praising uh, Indian medicine, and this oath they had to take. Equity was in, included in that. Where do you see in the time that we have left? Where do you see this issue of equity as it takes hold in certain institutions? Um, do you see it getting embedded? Within, with, within, or do you think there's a possibility that once we run these through the courts, that this can be dispensed and put put off to the side? Well, I don't think the courts are going to help us because what people need to understand the history of critical race theory is, is it's a branch from critical legal theory. That's where it originated, and that originated in the law schools. So all of these judges um, and, and these these folks who are appointed to the bench over the course of the past 40, 50 years or so, have all been brought up to believe that Lady Justice should have her blindfold lifted mm. and that she should take into consideration the appearance and personal background of the person in front of them rather than what they did or what the facts of any given case are. The judges are not going to save us. This is going to be a political battle. Um, we're going to need to elect people, especially those who appoint judges, like mm. the governor. We're going to have to elect people who are committed to restoring sanity. And 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 through a generational process of going to war with this wokeness in these institutions and rooting it out. See, and that's what concerns me when you look at these these medical students at the University of Minnesota who apparently put this together. A group of these students put it together and then with help of the administration and the faculty at the University of Minnesota created this bizarro uh, oath. And we'll share with you the audio coming up. You know, my concern is. They're young now. They're going through school now. But these individuals are potentially going to be the ones that grow up yeah. and end up out being and becoming CEOs of yep. corporations or or doctors or surgeons. And and these are going to be the ones that are going to be running so many of these institutions. And right. what are we doing to them now? And where are they going to be once they once once they get their degrees and they're out in the real world? Well, and that's why we, it's it we cannot <laughs> tread lightly. OK. And this, I'm, I'm speaking now to my my co my would be colleagues in the legislature, um, current members, candidates who are going to win. We we have to take the opportunity that voters are about to provide us, I believe, mm -hmm. and we need to run as far as we possibly can with it. We need to put the pedal to the metal because we do not have time to allow this wokeness to calcify in these institutions. We have to provide people with the ability through the power of their individual choice. To be able to walk away from, reject, and defund this nonsense. That is the only way we're going to defeat it. We're not going to convince these people that they're wrong. They have abandoned their faculty of reason. Right. They don't have right. it. They can't be reasoned with. They have chosen insanity. That's what they, they have adopted it as a means of cognition. Being crazy. That's what they're for. So you're not going to reason with them. You have to defeat them. And you're going to do it two ways. You're going to defeat them politically by voting against them. And you're going to defeat them economically by taking your money somewhere else. And our job as legislators is to provide the mechanisms through which people can do that economic voting. Where can people find out about uh, uh, your, uh, your campaign there? HudsonForMN.com. I know you got to hit the road. Thank you so much for uh, coming in studio on short notice, man. I really do appreciate it. And we'll, uh, we'll get you back on again real soon. Really enjoy the conversation. Looking forward to it. Thank you.